the number that caught the world's attention was more than one million people arriving to Europe uh, asking for asylum in 2015. I guess from then, uh, these numbers have been falling actually because uh, pretty much half of these one million people who was coming from Syria, these were refugees. And so that's a very special situation and that's not what we as economists are equipped to study. So what we have been doing is really focusing on these irregular economic migrants that are coming a lot from West Africa, coming to Europe, and these do face en enormous risks in their, in their journey. So um, typically the journey starts by crossing the Sahara Desert, and this is very risky because these young men, mostly young men, they are, um, I mean, they, they come in open trucks from which they fall, they are left behind to die by their smugglers, and so this is extremely risky. And then uh, typically they, t they get to Libya so that they cross uh, the Mediterranean uh, through the, the central uh, route. And there in Libya they also face uh, tremendous vulnerable conditions because oftentimes the smugglers don't really get them across the ocean and they are doing forced labor and subject to a lot of violence and, and difficult conditions. And then, I mean, what you see most in the media is the Mediterranean crossing, which is also risky, but actually it's the less risky part of this journey. So overall, the numbers we have, which I mean are not perfect, um, give us, uh, I mean, a risk of dying of uh, about one third. So one out of three people that try this journey die in the way. So I would say these are huge numbers. Um, even though, I mean, nothing close to the, that one million that we saw in 2015. And this is an extremely risky journey. Yeah, this has been a question that uh, we had since we got uh, aware of this phenomenon. And we have done uh, several experiments, different types of experiments, trying to learn exactly about this. How aware are irregular migrants of these risks before they start their journey? And uh, is there anything we can do about it? So uh, what we learned, I mean, we did, we did some initial uh, field work uh, in the Gambia, which is actually the, the country in West Africa that has the highest proportion of irregular migrants at, at this time. In 2017, we um, did this study where we found that these young men, they thought the risk of dying in this journey was actually one out of two, 50%, okay? And still more than half of those in our sample did want to embark on this irregular journey to Europe. So it's not that they are not aware. And in fact, what we found in this first uh, lab in the field experiment was that um, if we were to tell them the risk that, well, we thought is the best measure we have, which is lower than what they thought, we, we would actually be encouraging these young men to come to Europe. I guess what we need to do here is to understand I mean, what is the context? Why are these people uh, being aware of these enormous risks still wanting to, to travel? Okay? And I think that has to do obviously with their um, extremely difficult, the, with the extremely difficult conditions of life that they are facing, with the lack of prospects, with the lack of an alternative to subsistence agriculture, the same way of living that their ancestors had for many centuries. Okay, and so um, we still, I mean, this was just an initial study with a few hundreds of people in our sample, so we wanted to try and look at um, a rigorous evaluation, a rigorous impact evaluation of information campaigns. This is something that the European Union, for example, has been funding a lot, but actually before our study it had never been evaluated. And so uh, we conducted this large field experiment with 4,000 people um, in the Gambia, in these rural areas from which most of these uh, irregular migrants are coming from. And one of the policies that we tested was exactly an information-based campaign. And what we found is uh, that, well, it, it does not seem to be enough to change people's uh, decisions and intentions uh, to embark on this journey to Europe. That's, that's also part of this project that we have been doing. And so we were thinking of, um, I, think, I think, again, the key issue here is to provide people with alternatives because this is what they are not finding uh, in, in their lives. And so what we were thinking of is what kind of policies, in addition to information, 
could we implement that could provide an alternative that could change people's decisions? And so we um, actually thought of two possible alternatives that we evaluate in this experiment that we conducted. Um, the first one was um, supporting regional migration. So in this area, uh, people can actually freely move across countries. Okay? They don't need a visa, they just need their identity card and they can move to say urban areas more developed uh, where they could find jobs and so what we did one one of these policies that we tried to evaluate was to provide information and support a small cash transfer that would pay for the travel expenses for these regional travel expenses and um, uh, of people going from these rural areas to Dakar the capital of Senegal uh, that is um, much more prosperous and with much much more job opportunities than where they lived and the other policy that we also um, evaluated is vocational training. Again, an initiative that um, Europe has been sponsoring a lot, but that in terms of effectiveness on changing people's minds regarding migration had never been previously evaluated. And, uh, and the idea here again for these two policies is to provide alternatives, to um, have people think about jobs that they, that they can take that can provide a different livelihood for them. And so what we found is, uh, well, it was in the context, uh, the post-pandemic context, so we just got this data out. And so what we see is that, well, I mean, with COVID, migration fell very strongly. It was already falling for, for some years, but now it, it really fell. But what we saw is that vocational training, so in these months after, um, after th this uh, policy was offered, actually reduced steps taken towards irregular migration. And we know that, I mean, this process of irregular migration is something that takes time because people need to prepare, they need to borrow money, they need um, to, to get ready. And so what, what we observe is that we see people not taking steps towards irregular migration. We also look at migration intentions and migration intentions um, to backway migrate to Europe. And backway migrate is the expression that is locally used for irregular migration, uh, have also fallen. Um, now, what we see, what, which was interesting to observe, was that this was, I mean, there was a kind of crowding out. And so what we see is people migrating more to Senegal, even if they are in this vocational training group. And so what we are thinking of here is that these, I mean, even though some people did not actually do the training, but just hearing about these other jobs seemed to make them think widely, think more broadly, not necessarily about going to Europe. But of course, this is only, um, I mean, this is relatively short run. So we measure the effect of this policy 16 months after. So and in a very specific context. So I think this is just initial evidence that um, should make us think that, well, we need to think harder about how to um, uh, influence, how to provide alternatives to people that are um, seri seriously considering uh, migrating regularly to Europe. So I think what is key here, what we learn, what we should keep learning about, keep experimenting and evaluating, is policies that provide alternatives to people, that uh, provide some hope, because what we, say, what we see from our fieldwork is that people in these areas are really desperate for an alternative and for a better life. Thank you.